I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Conversations Land Acknowledgement. This event is being recorded and will be posted online at the Learning Lab site, Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center in Alaska. Before we begin our conversation with Melissa, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional and present day lands of the Denina Athabascan people. I live and work in a place called Dahai Kok in the upper inlet dialect of the Dena'ina Kanaga language. The name that colonizers gave this place is Anchorage. I thank the Denina Athabascan people for the place where my home is and for the place where I work at the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center office at the Anchorage Museum. I would also like to thank our funders who made this event possible, the generous supporters of the Arctic Studies Center in Alaska, and the Smithsonian Office of the Associate Provost for Education and Access through their Youth Access Grant Program. Next, I'd like to introduce our featured speaker, Melissa Shaganoff. Melissa is an artist, curator, and social activist, and she is an indigenous woman of Atna Athabascan and Paiute heritage. Her artwork explores identity and representation, utilizing customary indigenous and Western methods. One of her projects as a social activist is to provide workshops for people to learn about and write their own land acknowledgements, which is what we'll be talking about today. To learn more about Melissa, you can go to her website, www.melissashaganoff.com. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? Wele Jan and Zarote, Melissa Shagnoff, Susetalan, Yudishios Koyakara Atlan, Naitini Ana Kayak Sensiaden, artist, as curator, Goreshna, Chinan Kotan, was at Nautlan. Wele Stagan, good morning. Wele Jan, good day. Um, my name is Melissa Shaganoff. I am Caribou and Fish Eater Clan from Night Dinyana, or the Log Over the River, or Chickaloon Village. Um, I'm an artist and curator, uh, and you know, to some extent, a social activist with uh, this kind of work. But I think that in in many ways, I, I really view myself as a communicator you know, someone who is trying to do work that allows us to better understand each other. Because um, I think that's what the work of decolonization is, which is uh, um, breaking down the barriers that, that really separate us uh, in understanding. Um, so I really consider that more of my role in my community um, of Naitiniana, Chickalun, uh, and Alaska. So uh, Chanan, Don, thank you so much for having me. To get us started, can you tell us what land acknowledgement is and what role it has in our lives? Absolutely. Land acknowledgement, uh, you know, is a statement. You know, Indigenous people have steward, stewarded uh, all places um, for thousands of years and their holistic understanding of the environment, you know, has created a sustainable and symbiotic relationship with the waters, plants and animals of every place. You know, land acknowledgement is a public recognition of that work. Um, you know, and is, and is a statement, you know, recognizing uh, Indigenous people for, for their stewardship and their care of a place. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of this simplicity and complexity when talking about land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement in its simplest form recognizes people, you know, it recognizes Indigenous people of a place. Um, but in its complexity, you know, it's, it's doing this work of countering colonial narratives, um, you know, in Alaska, you know, where I am from, it, it counters narratives of discovery or the untouched wild, um, the last frontier. Uh, Alaska is a very old place and it's a very interacted place, interacted with place and um, land acknowledgement gives us opportunities to recognize that and gives us the opportunity to really speak to um, those, those narratives that confuse us about what the truth is. And the truth is indigenous people, uh, are the only people who've sustainably cared for um, the lands that we are all on. You know, um, I think land acknowledgement offer, also offers us an opportunity to look at our own work and look at our own sort of personal effects and, you know, experience on the land um, in our own stewardship and, and allows us to um, start to learn from indigenous ways of being, you know, uh, Land acknowledgement, I think, is is really is really more of a framework um, of building relationships with people and working towards equity, um, because land acknowledgement is uh, this opportunity to 
publicly recognized people, which is a, a very indigenous way of being, recognizing work, recognizing effort, and recognizing long histories. Um, but I think is I think when you're thinking about the what land acknowledgement is, it's also important to recognize what land acknowledgement is not. You know, land acknowledgement is not reparations, you know, it's not reconciliation. Land acknowledgement is a gesture, you know, and I think that uh, it can be a powerful gesture because I think it can it can open up the door um, to, to starting a relationship with somebody. It can make um, somebody feel very seen in a place. Uh, and I think land acknowledgement can really lay out what it is that we need to, what we need to do, the work that we need to do personally. What do we need to know about uh, the work and histories of indigenous people? And what do we need to do um, in order to support them and uh, really lift the work they're doing um, within their own tribal communities and um, tribal sovereignty? Could you give a brief overview of your workshops and some examples of groups who participated in them? Yes, um, I apologize. My, uh, I might have a guest appearance coming into the frame. She's jumping on my desk. I've um, been doing these workshops um, on land acknowledgement here in Alaska and now really kind of across the world um, as we are all moving into a digital space. Um, so I provide a two hour workshop uh, that focuses on the sort of communal and personal understandings. Oh shoot, sorry, she's sitting on me. That's okay, so cocktails are allowed. So it's fine. <laughs> I, I just don't want her to step on my keyboard and knock me out of the Zoom. <laughs> the workshop is a, oh geez, is a, a conversation-based uh, facilitation. So we really talk about what land acknowledgement is and, and kind of the, the 101, the basics, but then also what is, what, what is it in its complexity and effect? You know, um, how is it that we can uh, personally invest in land acknowledgement framework to, you know, offer, offer our offer and share our power and privileges. You know, um, I think that uh, the workshop is really about, um, I think, teaching all of us that land acknowledgement is just opening the door to have a better relationship. Um, with indigenous people, with indigenous histories, um, and really kind of working out what it is that we don't know and what do we need to teach ourselves? What work do we need to do personally? Um, yeah, so I've, I've done uh, the workshop with many different organizations, many, many nonprofits and uh, many institutions, um, ranging from NOAA to Fish and Wildlife Service, um, he, but also to, uh, you know, smaller groups, um, local groups, high school groups. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's been kind of moved many, many different places. I, I've done the, uh, a workshop with the Museum of Norway. And uh, yeah, I think that as land acknowledgement becomes more and more commonplace, you know, we have to learn how to um, be critical of it how to critique it. And this workshop is really about asking all of those questions, exploring you know, what sort of th barriers that we personally have in doing a land acknowledgement, what sort of fears do we have, um, and addressing them, addressing them because I think once you talk about them in, in more of a conversation, you start to map out what you don't know and what work you have to do personally. Yeah, and, and we'll yeah. get to that in my last question where, where um, we'll do a critique of my the land acknowledgement that I gave. Mm -hmm. um, one question I have is it sounds like um, a lot of different organizations have been able to participate in your workshops, but there might also be you know individuals out there who are interested yes. in being able to bring this into their own lives um, if they don't happen to work for an organization that would um, you know, be involved in one of your workshops. Do you sometimes have events where just individuals, wherever they are, whoever they work for, can um, get involved in one? Absolutely. So on my website, you know, I, I have um, different resources that are available to individuals. Um, but I also on my website, you know, have uh, events where I'll be doing the workshop and people can either pay for them or they'll be 
uh, I also, if, it, if I work with large organizations, I always ask them to, um, if they have the ability to also sponsor a, a workshop for their community in which they work on, you know, because I think it's, it's really all about grounding ourselves. And so mm -hmm. the workshop is very personal based, you know, it's about um, addressing what barriers you, you personally have in doing a land acknowledgement and really kind of mapping out why you want to do a land acknowledgement. Because I think when, once you figure that out, it, it becomes a lot clearer what it is that you need to learn and what it is that you need to say. Well, it sounds like from what you're just saying now that um, people have actually talked to you about the impact and being in one of your workshops. Can you share just a few examples of that kind of feedback? So the workshop is discussion, discussion based. So um, I think that in many instances, a lot of those fears that someone initially felt start to go away. And, and that's really just kind of the work of, um, of recognizing what those fears are, you know, of, of, of mispronouncing something, of misrepresenting someone. I think that um, we're getting to a point where we understand indigenous histories are very complex. And uh, I think that once we start to address those, it becomes obvious, um, you know, and, and I think that people leave the workshop uh, really with a plan on what it is that they need to be working towards. You know, one of, one of the um, takeaways somebody shared with me is that, you know, I think, I think my, my next thing that I need to do is really learn about what sovereignty means. What does tribal sovereignty mean? You know, or another person, you know, I really emphasize that, you know, um, land acknowledgement is just a gesture, you know, it it's just a statement. It's not work of reparations or reconciliation, but I think it can help sort of frame out what those works personally can be for you, you know, and a lot of that is just um, teaching yourself about what uh, tribal governments and tribal organizations are working on, you know, what it is, what work are they doing, and how can you support them with whatever power and privilege you have within your institution, within your workplace, or uh, within your community sounds like some of what you're saying, including even some of the information you gave us um, with answering my first question was that um, land acknowledgement gives you an opportunity to learn more, learn what you don't know, learn what you can know, and that, you know, all of that might not go into a land acknowledgement in a specific instance, but having that knowledge base really informs even a short land acknowledgement and then informs your understanding of Indigenous cultures and the ongoing learning that needs to be done about indigenous cultures. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, that that's really the most important thing that people walk away with is, is really just kind of um, a little bit of a playbook as to what they personally need to be doing, you know, what they personally need to be doing in their, in the work that, um, that they have to, they have, you know, to, to learn about, you know, that's, that's the work of equity. You know, it's, it's kind of like figuring out where, in what ways um, can you, can you share or um, gift your power to somebody? And sometimes that means, uh, you know, humbling yourself to, to really, uh, ask people about themselves, to introduce yourselves. So, you know, I started this workshop, you know, by saying, which means I'm responsible for Chickaloon Village. And I think that once you start to personally understand what you're responsible for, um, you can start to like, uh, I think, strategize how to include that in your land acknowledgement. Your land acknowledgement, um, if this is if this if this is work about uh, equity and change, it means that it's ongoing, and so you have to always be personally looking at the work that you're you're doing and thinking about um, who am I who's listening to me you know who's in my audience, um, and what ways can I uh, use this moment to not only recognize Indigenous people but also recognize the work that they're doing to this to this in this particular instance you know land acknowledgement i don't think should become this rote memorization sort of thing it should be um something that grows and changes with you and your knowledge because uh this is the work of equity it's a continual you know um education of what it is that we don't know and indigenous histories that have uh, largely been erased in our society my next question um, is about the guide that you've written to get people started on learning about land acknowledgement and about how to write one. Um, we only have a few minutes for this because I, I do want to get to my last question. 
um, people in the audience, this resource will be available both on Melissa's site and then on the site um, for this webinar and where this recording will be posted. Yeah, so um, this is just a very brief guide. Um, I also want to recognize the US Department, United States Department of Art and Culture. They also have an honorary native land guide, which is linked in this guide. Um, but it's really just a, com a, a compiling of the work that I've done in this workshop and some of the things that have um, come from it. So I'm just going to run through um, some of the pages. So a lot of the sections sort of um, emulate my workshop uh, and then also make certain points. You know, what what can land acknowledgement do? You know, um, what should I do? What, why should I do a land acknowledgement personally? What kind of things you need to be asking yourself? Um, and of course, this is this is an, an ideal sort of situation. You know, land acknowledgement also um, can really just be at the beginning. Like maybe you're just at that point where you're just starting to learn the language or you're just starting to learn that your community is a hub community for many indigenous people. You know, so this is just a, a very basic guide. Um, this is also a lot of uh, clickable links on resources that I've learned from um, and are also really uh, great ways to start your um, land acknowledgement research. My last question, and you've touched upon this already, is that um, if someone's worried about pronouncing a, a name wrong, like I did in the land acknowledgement I gave, I tried my best. I did find an audio link online of how to say it, but Athabascan letters are difficult for me to pronounce. Um, or if someone's worried about doing one incorrectly, is there advice you have for dealing with those concerns? So um, you, in your land acknowledgement, say something like, I live and work in the place of the Leocock, you know, um, and your pronunciation was, was, was pretty off, right? I think that that's uh, an important sort of moment. Um, you know, of course, doing your best and, uh, you know, attempting is, is actually a good sign, a really beautiful sign of your respect. But I think that you can take it a step further and uh, actually reach out to um, a speaker, reach out to um, somebody if you have, you know, compensation, if you have that ability, if not, um, again, going to YouTube, you know, starting that language journey. Um, I also think that uh, in some ways, for me, when I do a land acknowledgement, and I know that um, I'm having going to have a hard time uh, pronouncing something, I'll at the end of my land acknowledgement, you know, kind of open it up and say, you know, I consent to any correction. If anybody has anything for me to um, to be corrected on, if I, I if I mispronounce something, um, you know, I I consent to any correction, you know, uh, and that in some ways kind of opens a door because yeah. I think that when people hear land acknowledgements. I know for me, if somebody does a land acknowledgement on my land and it's something's mispronounced, you know, oftentimes it's kind of like, oh, it's mispronounced again. Like, oh, there's another an, an, another person who who's not who who didn't do it right. But if you if you open that door initially and say, you know, I I really hope that that you will approach me and correct me. I think that that's part of this work, which is being open to correction, open to being called out, you know, really being called in, in this work. Yeah. Um, because uh, you start a relationship at that moment with somebody and, and that can be a really beautiful thing, you know? Well, Melissa, um, I had one idea is so I actually did reach yeah. out to somebody <laughs> about how to pronounce that, but that was the best my mouth could do. So what I was thinking, um, if I could redo it again, what, what I, would have liked for myself to have done is was to ask the person who helped me to be in the audience and ask if it's okay to call on that person to pronounce the name properly. Would, would that be a good way to um, start improvement? Yeah, I think so. Um, I also think that in some ways, if you can use your land acknowledgement to um, point out uh, and give power to the language work of speakers, mm -hmm. language work of indigenous people. Um, that's a really uh, beautiful way um, to to offer offer some of um, that that power and privilege and be given and giving it away and and really in an indigenous way, which is about sharing sort of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a that's a really great example. Uh, you know, and obviously, too, if you have uh, the the budget, you know, to to speak to, to have a speaker, you know, um, to be able to compensate them for their time um, and, you know, really, really do the work of um, trying to start a relationship with people. And that that is out of respect and equity and um, 
you know, and respect and equity of their time and their resources as well. I only had a short amount of time to give my land acknowledgement because, you know, of the limited time for this webinar. And um, so I was, you know, trying to keep it short. Um, and I know that's not an ideal situation, but let's say if someone's giving a conference presentation and they only have like 15 minutes or 20 minutes to talk, um, they might be worried about how to do a, a you know, worthy land acknowledgement in such a short period of time. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Could we just say that we apologize for only having a short time um, and then give a short one or? Well, yeah, you know, and I also think that it, in some ways, if you qualify those things of saying like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a land acknowledgement with uh, the, the time and resources that I, that I have provided to me. And, you know, I hope to do it the best that I can. I think that uh, sometimes just speaking that truth and just speaking where you're at, even in your own education and learning um, can be quite powerful um, and also transparent. I think that uh, land acknowledgements um, feel hollow when they feel memorized or they feel um, not personally felt. Okay. Ideally for something like the webinar that we're having now, would it have been an improvement for me to find someone in the Denina Athabascan community to and offer them an honorarium to provide a land acknowledgement at the start of the webinar? Yeah, that's definitely a good way of going about it. I also think that um, in that moment, though, too, that 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 happens quite a bit is that indigenous um, leaders are asked to come and give a welcome or a land acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And even if they are being compensated for their time, I think another way to uh, to to do this kind of work is also to invite them in into whatever the conference, the discussion is you know it's it, you can you can take it a step further and you should um that these spaces that uh you know are primarily non-indigenous spaces we need to indigenize them we need to indigenize them by um offering a seat at the table right offering a seat in the audience you know for for these these things that we are also we collectively are also um learning from and um growing from before we open things up to um, audience questions, are there any other um, ideas or thoughts that have come up to you, you know, before we switch to the next section of the webinar? You know, I, I think that uh, I, I just want to reiterate too that that the way that I teach land acknowledgement and and uh, really the goal is is having us learn about relationships. You know, learn about what does it mean to um, to start to unpack what it is that we don't know and build relationships with our indigenous community um, so we can offer uh, a more holistic and equitable view on on where we're at um, and that should uh, and does include indigenous people and that's a, a really important aspect um, if you're doing a land acknowledgement to a room without any indigenous people then there's much more work that needs to be done Okay, so we're going to move on to the uh, audience question section. And David um, would like to know, he, you had mentioned Norway. He asked if you could speak to the movement outside of North America. Well, so I was working uh, with the museum in Tromso um, through different sort of colleagues uh, that had, you know, seen land acknowledgement stuff that I had been doing in Alaska. Um, you know, I can't really speak to... Uh, I, I would say to the, um, I guess the temperature, you know, obviously here in, in, uh, in the United States, you know, in, or what is known as the United States is, uh, is, is a place where land acknowledgement is becoming more and more commonplace, you know? And I think that um, when we dive into land acknowledgements, uh, we also are recognizing the very complex colonial histories in different places. And, you know, that area of the world has a whole, different sort of uh, complexity of colonization, you know, and the different sort of iterations that they've gone through. Um, you know, I can really only speak to, uh, to the experience that um, 
that 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 I've that I've lived here in Alaska um, and in the states. You know, I'm also a Paiute person. Uh, so yeah, as land acknowledgement becomes more and more commonplace, I think that we're starting to understand that it also looks different in different in different um, countries. You know, Australia, New Zealand uh, have really kind of like led the charge on land acknowledgement. And it's definitely in Australia with Aboriginal people, uh, a very traditional sort of practice. Whereas land acknowledgement we see here is becoming, uh, you know, very institutionalized. And I think that it's in those moments where we can start to be critical of it because we need to look at the person, you know, within the institution doing a land acknowledgement. I think that I, I never really want to hear a land acknowledgement from somebody that isn't personally felt or coming from um, a really uh, uh, authentic place. You know, land acknowledgement should be about um, continual work, uh, continual personal work um, to understand uh, Indigenous ways of being, understand Indigenous histories. Um, and to you know, give power back to indigenous people and the current work they're doing. Speaking of land acknowledgements being different in different places, um, Aaron Kroll posted um, a message. He said that, um, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this. He said that mm -hmm. one idea for all of us who are going to present at a meeting or conference would be to ask the organizers to provide appropriate land acknowledgement, uh, land acknowledgement information to all of the participants in advance so we could include it consulting with local tribal leaders would make sure everyone has the correct information, including the identity of the people. I think that that's actually a really um, interesting approach, you know, because uh, it's in some ways telling um, the organization or place that you're collaborating with, you know, what it is that you, uh, you stand by and the sort of things you care about and recognizing those indigenous people. I think that that's, a, that's an excellent way of um, first addressing it. You know, uh, I've I've had that question, um, similar questions in my workshops before, of 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 almost feeling like a nervousness because doing a land acknowledgement in a space where they know that it might not be commonplace or it might not be uh, something that's well received. I think that in some ways you're qualifying your your discussion with them and your work with them um, before you even get started. You know. Of course, you should be doing your, your own your own research as well, um, but that's just another part of the conversation. I have another question myself, but before I ask that one, is there anyone else in the audience that wanted to share a question in the chat box? In making land acknowledgements, I worry about them sometimes coming across as hollow or rote, as Ms. Shaganoff noted. Do you have any guidelines for determining when a land acknowledgement is fitting for a situation, particularly informal ones? That's, that's a wonderful question. You know, I think um, I always recommend that people uh, really think about kind of like where they are. Um, I'm actually going to pull up something that addresses this. I can't. Um, you know, I think that there should be a few things that, that you ask yourself, you know, in creating your land acknowledgement, you know, do you know who the indigenous people are in the place that you live or work? Do you know the work they do to care for that place? In what ways can you acknowledge them? You know, what work will you do to make sure they hear and see it? And then also recognizing those barriers and fears. If your barriers and fears are that it comes off as hollow, then you need to think personally as, as to why you want to do this this, this moment um, of land acknowledgement and uh, really kind of speak to that. You know, I think some of the most powerful land acknowledgements I've heard um, come from sort of a personal experience, you know, from an educator, you know, wanting to talk about, um, about uh, mission schools in Alaska and wanting to recognize um, that history in their education, you know, or somebody who is just learning, uh, you know, um, Atna language and is going to do their best to, to pronounce these things. You know, I think that when land acknowledgement uh, becomes really about your personal um, journey of education, uh, I think that it comes off um, much more sincere. And I'd also like to point out that some of those considerations that Melissa just mentioned are in that land acknowledgement PDF. So once you read her guide, you'll, you'll get that, um, 
those those thoughts that you can consider for yourself in your journey about learning and about speaking a land acknowledgement. I have another question here. Maybe you've mentioned this already, but what is the best website uh, that provides a map for tribal names? There's, uh, there's actually a few apps. Um, there's nativeland.ca, um, it's a Canadian one. Um, there's, there's also, I think that that's actually probably the most, uh, the most comprehensive one right now. Um, let me see if I can put it on, on the, in the chat for that. Actually, I think it's on, it's on the PDF. Uh, the last page of that guide has titled links to about a dozen different resources that are available online. One thing I thought I could add, and you can let me know what you think about this, Melissa, is, um, when I was first thinking about my land acknowledgement, I thought, well, should I also acknowledge the indigenous peoples of Washington, DC, because even though I'm based in Alaska, the organization I work for is based in Washington, DC. And um, so one of the processes I went through to start learning that information online was of course to do a search. And of course the first searches that came up weren't from indigenous sites or authored by indigenous peoples. Yeah. So, you know, I read that information. I actually found a couple of very thorough, um, complex ones, which are a good sign. But then I also knew that I wasn't done until I read some, you know, examples that were authored by indigenous people. And I was able to find that. And, and just in case people are interested, one thing I found was that in DC through the uh, George Washington U University, there's an at t Center for Indigenous Politics and Policy. And the director there, her name is Elizabeth Rule. She's a member of the Chicksaw Nation and she created something called Guide to Indigenous DC, which is a mobile app and a digital map. So I, I didn't know about that. So I know I'm really excited to explore that and to learn more about it and have time you know, after this event to think about your feedback about my land acknowledgement and then spend time learning more so that I begin that ongoing process of self-learning and community connections and, and improving my work. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, as you dive into that own, your own research and dive into, you know, to resources too that are written by Indigenous people, you'll realize that a lot of areas, a lot of places, you know, because of displacement, because of, you know, urbanization have become hub communities or have become communities of many different indigenous people, you know, um, that are taking place on two lands on, on, in, in Alaska and in DC, you know, in this, in this sort of virtual way. And I think that, uh, it's important to do our best to recognize, you know, everyone. Every time I'm in Anchorage and I'm recognizing the Denina people of Dagayakak, I always try to recognize that Anchorage, Dagayakak, is um, a hub community of many different Indigenous people. And those Indigenous people bring that stewardship, bring that way of being um, into every place that they, they move within. And, you know, and it's up to us to recognize that and to be thankful for that because, um, it's truly uh, a really sustainable way of living in, in all of these places. And we need to learn from those, those, those ways of being if we are going to continue to be here. <laughs> so I have another um, question from the audience. You've spoken about work that individuals need to do when writing a land acknowledgement, examining their own knowledge and relationships. What about land acknowledgement that is on behalf of an institution? For example, a land acknowledgement that's printed on a sign on a building. What mm -hmm. kind of work should an institution or museum do before doing something like this? Um, I think that institutions have a lot of power and privilege and that part of their planning process in writing a land acknowledgement, creating it, and certainly before putting it on a sign or on their building, there needs to be you know, adequate consultation with the indigenous people of that place. Um, there needs to be um, adequate sort of language work um, on, on uh, the indigenous place name, as well as you know, what those indigenous people call themselves, you know, um, I think that uh, it's so important to, you know, to ask people um, what needs, to, what does this community need to be known? Um, what needs to be known to this community? And I think Indigenous people have been examining this for so long. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about, it's about truth telling and 
if you want to recognize indigenous people in a place, then they need to be part of um, how, how, how they are represented. Uh, so I would say that that's really kind of the biggest um, part. Uh, and I also think too that institutions like all of us need to think about how can this sign or how can this land acknowledgement change? In what ways are we going to um, recognize that putting it on the wall or putting it on a sign doesn't mean it's the most correct, doesn't mean it's the it's the end of the work, it is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. So is there ways that um, you can make that land acknowledgement uh, more of a living commitment, you know, towards um, equity, towards recognizing Indigenous people, Indigenous histories? You know, because as we know, um, you know, five years ago, I don't think anybody, you know, would have thought twice about a land acknowledgement. And as we're moving into the space where it's becoming more and more commonplace, then we also need to always be ready to change with it, to grow with it, um, and to be critical of it, because that's the next best thing, right? I want young people to look at that land acknowledgement and think, oh, that's great, but I bet they could do this. I bet they could be do something better. And then hopefully we can make those changes together. Um, yeah, I think that uh, for institutions, there needs to be um, a way in which that work can grow and also a way for institutions to be accountable to that work, you know, um, to be accountable to this continual learning and continual um, lifting of indigenous histories and current work and stewardship. It seems really important that they would represent the ongoing work on that process to act as a model for other people looking to do that quality of work. Yeah, and that's kind of another aspect of what I've been doing. So I'll do these workshops and I've probably done upwards of like 75 now in the last few years, it's been, it's been a, it, it kind of like exploded. And I think that um, part of like what, what I do in my own sort of like community volunteerism is that you know, I try to offer every person that takes my workshop the 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 ability to reach out and to and to um, you know talk about uh, what ways can uh, this land acknowledgement represent um, really our our feeling about this, our feeling of of wanting to um, bring in and represent and lift Indigenous people. Um, one organization that I work with, a gallery, uh, they brought me in with their advisory board, um, along with Indigenous leaders, uh, um, which they paid, and we came up with a land acknowledgement, and we qualified it at the end saying, you know, this land acknowledgement will change as our relationships um, grow as our edu as our own personal sort of education grows on indigenous histories. Um, yeah. What, because, what gallery was that? Because that deserves a shout out. Yes. Bunnell, Bunnell Street Art Center um, right. has been a great represent, rep, representative of mine um, in the art world and also in uh, land acknowledgement world. They've been doing really a lot of a lot of important work. So please definitely um, visit their their websites. We have a comment that I'd like to bring up just because it exemplifies some of what we were just saying. Summer from the Denali National Park and Preserve has said that we've been working on this with the help of Karen Ivanoff, who's denied Athabascan. We've reformatted our mission to ancestral and land connections, working together with uh, Denali's first peoples, meaning purpose and invitation to the native people of the lands in and around what is called today Denali National Park to participate and give voice to projects, programs, and writing that represent them. And he also pointed out that it's still a work in progress as they continue to meet with tribal nations. So that, that sounds like a really good um, institutional representation of land acknowledgement work and that ongoing nature that you're emphasizing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, that's, a, that's a really beautiful one. And Karen Ivanoff is just um, such an amazing, amazing leader. Um, that's so, that's so exciting to hear, you know, uh, really beautiful words, words. So we have another question here. Have you worked with educational institutions on acknowledgements in educational settings with youth? Do you have advice on meaningful, relevant conversation with students about indigenous history, land acknowledgement? And she's specifying this as someone who's non-indigenous. 
Mm -hmm. So I've, I've worked with um, young people in many different sort of capacities. Um, so I worked with uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm currently working with um, University of Alaska Anchorage, but I've also done land acknowledgement workshops with high school students. Um, and then uh, actually did a as, as kind of a, a, a version of a workshop with um, an arts camp this summer. You know, uh, all I can say is the future is bright because <laughs> uh, young people and uh, the high schoolers and the middle school age group that I worked with in the camp um, were so open to hearing about this, you know, and open to listening and also offering uh, an opportunity on on how it is that, that they can, you know, better um, respect and maybe even embody some indigenous values. So a big part of my workshop is that I have, um, you know, the 101, what land acknowledgement is, but then the second part, which is about really indigenous value systems and how land acknowledgement um, doesn't represent them, but but is is part of that framework of acknowledging, part of that framework of of looking at history, of of honoring the stories, of honoring and ancestors, you know, and, and talking to young people about that, talking about the value system and really kind of posing the question of, you know, how can your, your school, you know, um, better recognize, you know, elders in your community? How can your school, you know, um, teach you, teach you more about the indigenous people? And they always have an idea and an opinion on that, you know, and it's, it really becomes more of, um, uh, uh, a talking circle with with young people and and it's really just kind of giving them the opportunity to to offer some some um some advice <laughs> and they're really good at it actually <laughs> uh i don't know if that's really answers the question <laughs> But I've had a really good experience. And for me, um, the way that I, I do that is I, is I really just ask, ask the kids the question. Um, mm -hmm. I really pose it to them on how they could change those things, uh, you know, while showing them the work that I do, because I do a lot of artwork too around um, land acknowledgement. And I think sometimes that creative kind of uh, uh, inroad in helps get them, get them thinking. I think that's a great answer to the question, because what's underlying it is that young people are enthusiastic for and receptive to this. And, and that's exactly what you want to find. And, you know, and any kind of work in that direction is better than no work in that direction. So I think it's, you know, in the end going to be all good. Yeah. The, the barriers are the adults. <laughs> the barriers <laughs> are, are us, you know, in our, in our fear of doing something wrong or doing something um, that is, that doesn't feel, that feels hollow or is offensive. And, I don't think that there's really a way around that, that I think that it, you really just have to go through it. You know, you have to do the brave thing and it's such a small, brave thing, but doing the brave thing of recognizing somebody, of recognizing indigenous people, even if you might fumble through it. Um, I think that, again, I, I think I spoke before, if you qualify it by saying, you know, I really consent to anybody, you know, correcting me or, or letting me know if I'm misrepresenting, um, uh, you know, the language here, um, you know, please, I consent to correction, please approach me at the end of this talk. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that, that an elder has come in and, you know, and wanted to talk to me about how I pronounce something or wanted to talk to me about maybe a group that I, I'd left out in a hub community. And, you know, it takes away that initial sort of um, that initial uh, defensiveness for me because I've opened myself up to be corrected. But then also, I think, offer somebody that opportunity um, to be brave in, in, a, in a way that uh, they might not have felt comfortable before. You know, I think that oftentimes we, Indigenous people oh, are hearing the wrong thing and we just become used to it, right? And why is it always on us to be the ones who are um, in the teaching space? If you come in a humble way, if you qualify something in a way that says I'm open to correction, you know, and I, I really would like to, you know, to start a better relationship to do the right thing. I think people um, are much more, more apt to uh, approach you in that um, relationship way. It really helps with people's concerns to know that they can and should ask for help. And that's something that would be well received.
Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's also, um, this is the process of change, right? The process of change is ongoing and you just have to really um, be in the space where you expect to make mistakes, um, but there's ways in which you can do your best. There's ways in which you can consult with people, um, but just realizing that uh, that you're going to go through, you're going to fumble, you're going to go through kind of those mistakes, um, but that's but that's this work, right? And uh, it's it's truly it's truly um, it's truly a personal journey because everyone is starting in a different place, you know, and uh, it should be something that grows and changes just as your knowledge is growing and changing, you know, and if you look at your land acknowledgement, it's not a stagnant thing. It's not something that, okay, I've written it down and this is the land acknowledgement I'll use every time. Um, then you're always in that place of, of humbleness. You're always in that place of, of thinking about why it is you want to be doing this, thinking about why it is, what it is it, what is it that you need to learn? Um, and that's a real, that's a real opening you know, uh, movement and um, really put you in this place to tell the truth of things. Uh, because I think that an important aspect of land acknowledgement is countering the erasure of indigenous peoples. And if we all counter that together collectively, if we all sort of like shoulder that work, it becomes uh, more widespread. You know, we all can become sort of um, people who are holding that responsibility because so often it's on the responsibility of indigenous people to teach everybody and that's uh not equitable and that's not um you know even even possible so we need to be doing the work ourselves to teach ourselves and 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 to really be looking to um for guidance from indigenous leaders so we only have about two minutes left, but we only have one question left. So hopefully okay. um, you can provide a few comments for this. There's a question. What are your thoughts on land acknowledgements on websites? I think that uh, land acknowledgements on websites um, are kind of similar to land acknowledgements um, being put on signage or within institutions. Um, there should be a moment where uh, in that land acknowledgement that you talk about kind of like the ongoing, um, the ongoing work and that, that this, is an, uh, this is a process of change. Um, I also think too that if uh, you're doing any sort of land acknowledgement work with individuals, you know, if you are reaching out to write the best one with with indigenous individuals, that credit needs to be given. You know, um, if something is translated, this is something that we've ran into a few times in in Degayakak and Anchorage, where a land acknowledgement has been written in Denaina that was, um, you know, obviously written by and uh, brought from an elder and language speakers. Uh, and we see it everywhere. I see it on email signatures, on on you know uh, websites, um, but they've forgotten to to quote and to recognize the the elder and the language um, you know speaker uh, learner who translated that. You know, so so I think that when you're putting land acknowledgments on websites, that you need to be um, aware of 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 offering you know. Um, credit to the, the people who've translated things for you. And then also uh, talking about how this is, this is something that um, will change and grow as we learn and change as well. We've reached the end of our time for this event. So we need to close the audience questions here. I'd like to thank you, the audience for joining us. And Melissa, I'd like to thank you for sharing your knowledge, insights and experiences with us and for providing us with clear steps on how we all can create opportunities to express respect and honor to the indigenous peoples that came before us, wherever we are now and wherever we travel to. As I mentioned, to help you write your own land acknowledgements in the future, Melissa is sharing her guide, You Are on Indigenous Land. You can find it on her website, www.melissashaganoff.com. And it's also available online at the Learning Lab site, Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center, Alaska, in the conversation section where the recording of this event will be posted next week. Today's webinar will be followed by a series of conversations beginning in February in collaboration with the Inuit Arts Foundation. 
Inuit artists in Canada will join Inuit artists in Alaska for six webinars in 2021. If you would like to receive invitations to these events, please send me an email at bittesnd at si.edu. Katie has posted that address to the chat box. Uh, you can also send me email addresses for other people you would like to have invited. Thank you again and take care. Chan.